Hey everybody, it's Colin McEwen from the New Fly Fisher. Thanks for joining us. This is kind of a short notice uh, event. Usually we do a lot of promotion about our weekly events. And as of late, we haven't been doing them. Uh, the weather's great, we're all out fishing. But tonight we got something really unique and special. Um, I've asked uh, two friends who own lodges in Labrador to come on our show to talk about the outstanding brook trout fishing in Labrador. One of the few places in the world where you can catch trophy brook trout. Talk about what it takes to go there, what you need, talk about the experiences. And I got a little surprise, especially for the Canadians that are uh, watching this, um, to, you know, have a look at what we're doing. You know something? I think we've got a problem right now. Oh, there we go. We're going up now. All right. So without further ado, let's get started. I got a feeling this, uh, hang on. Yeah, he, so he's Ro meeting. Robin, have you got another computer? I'm only showing three people watching and that can't be. So there's something wrong. Uh, do I have another computer? Yeah, there we go. We got it up. Okay. Sorry, everyone that's watching. We're having a few technical problems here and we're going to get, try this again and stand by. There we go. Now we're getting it sorted out. Ooh, that's a nice size fish. I will catch these all day. That is what you're in for on this episode. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, as I said in the opening, this is kind of a short notice uh, get together, but it's for a very good reason. Uh, we got an opportunity to have two of the top lodges in Labrador, and there are also two of the top lodges in Canada, to come on the show to talk about Labrador, to talk about the brook trout fishing, and much more. Let me welcome Paul Ostegi and Robin Reeve. Oh, I think I clicked you off there uh, accidentally. Hang on. Oh, Paul, you want to? You just gave the wave. Go ahead, Paul. You want me to talk? Yes, please. Well, welcome everyone. Nice to be here tonight. Thank you for the invitation, Colin. Good to see you again, Robin. And uh, yeah, we're here to talk about Labrador, a beautiful part of the world with uh, some of the best uh, native brook trout fishing and landlocked salmon uh, in the world. Hands down. Okay, so and, and when I'm talking about Paul, Paul, if you don't mind hitting that mic. Uh, Paul's uh, actually in Montreal. Robin's down in beautiful Vermont. And uh, I think the, the, I can, first of all, let me say that Paul's got a beautiful place. Both the lodges are in Western Labrador. Paul's has got Mackenzie River uh, Fly Fishing Lodge. Robin owns uh, Three Rivers Lodge. I've had the pleasure of going to both of these lodges. They're really outstanding. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, I think the, the, the best way to start this uh, event is, I'm gonna play a little video that discusses why I love brook trout fishing in Labrador so much and uh, why it's such a very, very special place. And I see, Paul, you're smiling because you know all about it and you know why I love it so much. But um, let's have a look here, see if I can get this up and it's gonna work. There we go. Brook trout, a spectacular species considered to be the prettiest game fish in the world. Like many anglers, I grew up catching these small stream jewels, fascinated by their stark natural beauty. I love the bright white along the edge of the pectoral fins that fades into reddish orange as it gets closer to the body of the fish. Of course, their blue halo scattered throughout their body often outlines a wide range of colored spots. Every part of a brook trout is unique and spectacular in color, especially as they move into their spawning colors in August. Like most anglers, catching a 15 inch brook trout in my home waters was considered a true trophy, a size you just hope to catch. So imagine fishing in a place 
where brook trout are not measured in inches, but by pounds. This is why Labrador brook trout are so special and why the cost and trouble of getting here is so worth it. So probably the best thing here, gents, uh, I'm gonna uh, start with Robin. Uh, I, I think I, I said everything in that little piece there about why the brook trout fishing is so fantastic and why I like it so much. And that is the fact that uh, you can't get brook trout like this in Vermont. You can't get this around where I live here in the Ottawa, Montreal area. Uh, I think of all the places where brook trout are in the Appalachians and across the, the United States and Canada, there's only a few places where brook trout get this epic. And I think I've seen it in your advertising when it says, don't you wish you lived 500 years ago and come to a place where it's still like a, what it was 500 years ago? Right. Well, the nice thing about Labrador is, well, several things that make it the brook trout fishing there as spectac spectacular as it is. First of all, uh, the Ungava Peninsula is where the species of brook trout originated. So they're going to acclimate to the conditions there better than they are anywhere else in the world. That's the first thing. The second thing is nobody screwed it up yet. And Paul and I are trying to keep it that way. It's so remote and so far away that, you know, there's no efflorescence dumped into the rivers. There's no dams. There's no stocking program that's ever been there. So it's just the way it was when the last glacier melted, I don't know, six, 8,000 years ago from that area. And, uh, and that's what, the, and, and it's the brook trout that is the big draw into Labrador. Okay. Uh, Paul, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what your perspective is? Well, it's exactly that. I was in a show, you know, we all do the, the fly fishing shows in, uh, in New England. And I had a, a friend there, he was looking at the pictures in my albums and he said, uh, oh my God, this is Maine on steroids. And I said, well, it's not Maine on steroids. It's Maine 150 years ago before the logging roads got in. And um, Labrador is protected by uh, isolation, difficulty of access. And uh, where we are, because uh, I've had always found it pretty cool. Me and Robin are good friends and I refer to him as my neighbor, even though he's 25 miles away but he's actually come to have dinner with us in a de Havilland beaver, okay, which is pretty neat. But the first time I went up there to guide and um, I had the, the mandate of, uh, of taking a, a multiple visit guest to the, to the previous owner down the river, I flew up the river with a, uh, on a de Havilland beaver and took pictures of the different rapids because the next day I'd have to go down it by canoe and I'd never been there before. And I was actually a little bit disappointed because I saw a lot of weeds and uh, I was like, oh, my God, this is pike water. Well, there is pike. Actually, there's a lot of species there all mixed in together. But it's astonishing. It's a, it's, they call it, what are they call the Highlanders, the people that went up there. It's a big plateau above Churchill Falls. And essentially what we're fishing is the rapids between the lakes. And they're not very deep. And so you do see weeds. But there's an incredible, an absolutely incredible amount of life there in biomass, either bait fish or trout. One day we were having lunch along the, along the alders and uh, one of the guests was dropping pieces of bread in the water. And then the next thing you know, there was, I don't know, a couple of dozen brook trout from maybe three inches to 10 inches eating these bread. And we came to the conclusion is that's where they live because if they were in the main body of river, they're going to get eaten. Yeah, that's true. And I've seen that in same. different parts of Labrador. I mean, you just don't catch the little brook trout because they get eaten. Oh, no, we don't. We don't. We don't even count them. Like you're taking a 15 inch fish. We don't count those. Okay. We count them above two and a half and three pounds. And when you do hook a par or a young brook trout and you're bringing them in, often they're lucky that they don't get shredded. It's a, it's a Jurassic Park basically it's pretty cool well i think uh, paul if you don't mind uh yeah thank you uh and, and for everyone that's wondering why i'm asking paul to turn off his mic we don't know why it's the first time it's ever happened but uh when paul turns on his mic we have echo both robin and i 
So, uh, Paul, I hate to do this to you, buddy, but I'm going to have to ask you to turn off and turn on. <laughs> it's going to sound weird. Anyways, uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, when I was at Robin's Lodge with Tom Rosenbauer a few years ago, uh, we were very fortunate because somebody who's been to his place quite a bit was there, and I asked him a few questions. And I think everybody who is a fly fisher and has been – um, angling for a few years, know this gentleman, and let's watch this video. When I first came to Labrador in, um, God, sometime in the mid 90s, it was, well, I came up here for the big brook trout. Everybody hears about the big brook trout. It's one of the wildest, emptiest, prettiest places I've ever been. At this point, I think this is my ninth or 10th trip here. And at this point, the people are my friends, I'm comfortable here, and it's arguably the best brook trout fishing in the world. Simple as that. Well, um, let me just get rid of this. There we go. So, uh, Robin, uh, I, I think, you know, John Garrich, well-known writer, traveled extensively. Uh, I remember when I was first learning to fly fish 30 years ago, and I read his book, and he, in the book he talked about coming to Labrador, and I was like, oh, I got to go there. Where brook trout are as long as your leg. I mean, I've got to go to a place like that. So uh, tell us about why John comes there, but not so much like about your – obviously about your lives, but it's also what it, the magic. Of Labrador, obviously the brook trout are the magnet, but it's it's much bigger than that. And I remember you articulating that so well once uh, when we were sitting around having a coffee one morning on your porch. Uh, <clears throat> right. Well, John, uh, you know I'm very fortunate that uh, John wound up coming to our place way back when 2001, I think, and he's come up about every other year since then. And of course, we've become really good friends, and we fished a lot together. And I know John pretty well, and I know that he is uh, very true to the truth. John writes things exactly the way they happen. And uh, that's what I appreciate him the most about it. He doesn't embellish at all. And uh, the it's hard to explain, but, you know, if I, th through the 23 years I've been doing this, I, I, I've answered a lot of emails, <laughs> thousands of emails. And I can sort of detect now from just a word or two from people what kind of uh, what kind of experience they're looking for. And I would like, you know, to, for people to understand that if you are really into catching a lot of fish uh, numbers wise, Labrador is probably not the place you want to come uh, because, as John has said and has said to me, myself and to, uh, hundreds of our guests that he's had dinner with at the table, you know, a four or five fish day is a really good day. But a lot of people, you know, they've been in Alaska and they fish the silver salmon runs where there's, you know, 6,000 fish in one eddy of the river and you can catch them on every cast. Well, that's good. I mean, that's enjoyable. And you got if you if the tug is a drug, you're really high. But that's not what Labrador is. And Labrador is a few really beautiful fish that you won't find anywhere else. And, yeah, you know, I've. I've got guests that who've had 30 fish days and I've got guests who've had one or two fish days, but the average fishing day for a big tri trophy brook trout is four five, six fish a day. That's a good day. And you know, it takes you 20 minutes to land them and you sit down and admire them after you let them go and you maybe have a cigar or have a, a, a lunch. And you know, it's, it's not like the fishing's not fast, but if you're in there to count numbers, you know, it's probably not the right place for you. Uh, right well now? said. Well, I think you're, you're, that's very apt what you said. And, and it's uh, the best way I can put it is I know people who Atlantic like salmon fish in Labrador and the, you've got the same story there. You're going to have one, two fish days. You're going to have zero days and you're going to have your rock star days. I mean, it's just the nature of the place. So I'm glad right. you gave that context to it. Um, Paul, would you like to say a few words about what makes it so special? Because John talked a little bit about it, but he didn't go into great detail. 
Oh, me, it's the it, it's the whole experience. It's the float plane in. It's the ins the isolation. No noise. I mean, I remember, I think the first time I was up there with you, uh, Colin, when we were filming and uh, we had at night, you can see the Milky Way. Okay? On a clear night, you can see the Milky Way. Sometimes there's northern lights. Okay, We got up in the morning and actually a picture that we used a lot, it, it, it looked like a sunset and it was a sunrise, right? Yes. The, wild, the wild fruit. It's just the whole thing. And, and uh, I'll go back on what Robin said. I fished, uh, I fished all over the world. And uh, you don't always catch 50 fish a day wherever you go. I've had zero days in Chile, you know, and uh, Patagonia. Uh, but it's hunting. You're hunting for apex predators. Um, these trout are survivors. They got big because they're old. And you can't be the apex predator in a watershed and be that numerous. It, it just not happens. But to me, that's the pleasure of it. It's, it's walking these wonderful, pristine rivers and hunting. You're going from pool to pool. And depending on the time of the year, every cast can be a surprise. I mean, uh, yeah, we're hunting for big, uh, for big brook trout, but we've had seasons where the water temperature never went above 60 Fahrenheit. So you'll have big lakers sometimes. You cast, you could hook a big laker. We have huge landlocked salmon sometimes in our pools. We've, we've caught them up to 15 pounds. So that, that's an explosion. I mean, they're, they're as aggressive as a northern pike, but they've got the speed of an Atlantic salmon. And then other times I, I've, I've hooked fish that I didn't land, and I'll never know what they were. It could have been an eight-pound brook trout. I'll never know. But uh, no one, no one, no one leaves there. I mean, we, we get we get back at the end of the day and you're tired because you've cast a lot. You've been waiting. You've been walking. And then all we have in the front is a yurt with a picnic table. And we sit in there and have a drink, smoke cigars, play crib. And it's quite a place because you can see all the, the, the graffiti left from the different anglers that visited. Like we got a, a beautiful brook trout drawn on that table by Jeff Courier. It's a, it's a happening, you know, it's a happening. Well, uh, you were talking about them being apex predators and uh, what more apt way to show how much uh, of a predator big brook trout are uh, than to show them and what people really get juiced about when they see our videos and that is munching poor little mice that have fallen into the river. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna put up uh, a couple of videos. I'll start first with a little video that has, I put this up on YouTube a few years ago and people seem to really like it. I want to fish this pool uh, now known as mouse pool and we're gonna use a mouse pattern and you were telling me there's a place I should fish in, in, a, in a certain way can you explain it to me quickly yes what you want to do is go right here cast across to the foam see in the center yeah the foam is trickling down cast across there and just keep the top of your rod up and just trickle back very slowly just to get your mouse moving just keep the rod tip keep, up keep, keep the line off the water up. and twitch it across just twitch it across okay Sorry, I said quickly, I just, I'm excited. I want to get one of these big trout. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So I switched to a mouse pattern. Danny gave me one of Bert's great mouse patterns. And I was, oh, look at this guy go. And uh, I was waking it through. I made about three or four passes and I'm just stripping an extra foot out each time. And uh, I just put an extra foot on it and this guy came up and just inhaled it. It was an incredible hit. Beautiful colors on this guy, it's big fish. I think I got him. He's not liking the shallow, shallower water, Danny, but I'll keep his head up here. I think he's ready. Yeah. Just take the time with him. It's all in real. Okay. He's got it right in the corner of the jaw. Oh. All right. Good job netting him there. Danny, you just lower it down a bit. Thank you. Oh, look at the colors Thanks. in that fish. Beautiful female. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Hopefully the camera can see that. Look at the spots. Just starting to get a bit of the spawning colors on. Look at the reds. 
Oh, what a gorgeous fish. Okay, this one, oh, ready to go. Thank you, sir, you did a great job. You're welcome, sir. And here's what I was using. And this was a, a great pattern that Bert tied. It's this mouse. Well, that was great. Let's get another one. <laughs> that was fun. So I'm working over this area here, and a lot of people just walk by it. But this is where having a great guide is so important. And Danny had told me that this looks like a flat. It isn't. There's a deep trough right through the center. There's boulders all through here, so there's lots of places for the fish to lie. The landlocks and the trout will be all through here, and what they're going to be doing is trying to find efficient places to lie, whether in front of a boulder, behind a boulder, on the edge, in a cut. They're going to be looking for efficient places to lie, and by that what I mean is they don't want to expend any more energy than they have to, and at the same time they want to be close to some deeper water for security, and at the same time they also want to be in a place where they can grab food. So if that little brook trout makes a mistake of going near that trough, they can dart out quickly and grab it and eat it and come back into cover, and at the same time they don't want to expend a lot of energy because the winter's coming and that's the worst thing they can do. If they want to survive the winter, they got to be big and fat and not burn any uh, calories. So when we're fishing in this type of area, we got to think about those things, looking for any type of mark on the top surface water that tells me there's a boulder or there's something underneath there that could be a possible lie for a big fish. Okay, he came right up and he just came right down on top of it. Oh, what a fish, what a fish. Oh yeah, he's, oh, he's, he's a strong shoulders. fish. He's a strong one. We got, got him. him. All right. The fish, the line came right around, right at the end of the swing. He came over, he rolled on top of it, he grabbed it, and away we go. What a beauty. Let's get him back in the water and look for some more. So Paul, um, if you don't put on, mind putting on your mic, uh, why don't you tell us, like you've got those beautiful uh, uh, Norwest canoes that you take people, I think they're 18 footers up and down the river. And you talk about the fishing experience, obviously we're using mouse patterns there, but can you explain to people uh, how you get them around on the Mackenzie River? Yeah, okay. Well, if, if we have, uh, actually there's, uh, there's three rivers that we fish that are, um, the comeback, the, the quartzite, and then uh, the Mackenzie. The Mackenzie's flowing out of Andre Lake where our camp is. Uh, the, to go to the quartzite and the comeback, quartzite's seven miles away, and the comeback is uh, about 14 up the lake. We use 20-foot uh, freighter canoes with 25-horsepower uh, Yamahas to get there. And then we get out, and uh, we walk, and we wade. Uh, to get, well, the Mackenzie is only a couple of hundred uh, well, a couple of hundred meters below the camp. Once again, we'll take a freighter canoe to get there, uh, anchor it close to shore, walk to shore. Then we have a, a trail cut along the river for about, I guess, about a mile uh, with exits to each pool. You get to another pond, a small lake. We have a canoe there. We'll cross that pond in a freighter canoe, get out again, once again, we've got a trail cut through the boreal forest with exits to each pool. Then we got another canoe, and then we go down to another rapid uh, further down. But uh, essentially, the only time that we fish from canoes is if uh, the water's high. There are a couple of pools that fish better from canoes, but literally 95% of our fishing is done wading, and the canoes are only used to uh, travel. But if the water's high, or an angler gets tired, or an angler has a little bit of less mobility, we are able to anchor in specific places because the fish are holding in specific lies. We know where they are. They're always in the same places, generally. So I'm gonna tell everyone that's watching this that, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Paul, just to uh, get your mic for a second. Thank you. Uh, that, uh, the river craft you're using there, 
same as that, uh, Rob, is they're really comfortable. You feel safe in them. Going to rapids, no matter where, where it is, uh, they're, they're built to take a lot of weight. In fact, uh, I happen to know a lot about the dimensions of the ones that you've got, and they're very similar to the ones Robin's got. I mean, they're, they're built for people to shoot a, mo or a moose excuse me, and throw it in there with the two guys. So they're, they're perfect. You put two people, three people in them. Uh, traditionally, when I'm shooting the show, I'll be in the bow, I'll have cameraman in the middle, and then we got the guy at the back, and we have absolutely no problem with all the gear and everything. So they're very safe. Um, we've got a question uh, asking about the leaders uh, that you use. And Robin, if you don't mind, uh, could you answer this uh, question from Melos? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, the brook trout are rarely leader shy. So you need to put something on the end of your line that will hold the weight, especially when they get downstream of you in the current. So we recommend one to three X and three X really only if you're tying on small nymphs or dry flies and two X or one X. Uh, and uh, if you're fishing streamers or are big dry flies or mice patterns like you were showing. Uh, anything less than that, you're going to break them off. Those big fish get downstream of you. A five-pound fish is going to pull 20 pounds on your line. So you got to you got to be prepared. And if you're not, you're going to hear that snap quite often. Yes, and if I could uh, add to uh, what you said there, Robin. If anything, uh, I'd encourage anyone that goes to Labrador, just like in any fishing, use the strongest leader tippet system you can to get those fish in quickly and don't over fight them, get them in, get your pitcher, release it safely. Uh, because uh, anything below three X, I mean, I think when I go to Labrador, especially I'm throwing mice and stuff, I'm using zero X, one X, two X maybe. But I, I use the heaviest leader system I can. Uh, to that, let's have a little video look at uh, most uh, patterns getting munched by big brook trout. And what I like about this video, and Robin knows this quite well, is I uh, was fortunate to accompany Tom Rosenbauer up to your lodge, Robin, and his biggest brook trout at that point was 15 inches that he caught, in, I think, in New Hampshire, he told me. So let's have a look at this video, and then I want to talk about where we were fishing, and it's part of the services you offer at, uh, at your lodge. So, and here we go. I both started by casting mice patterns to see if we could trigger a strike from a brook trout. What happened next is something Tom will always remember. We're here in a different river today. It's at the outlet of a lake, and um, we don't know much about it. And uh, it's fairly wide. You can see it's wide and shallower here. There's a central current thread going through here where the trout probably are, and not knowing anything else, we're going to try a mouse. Oh, yeah! Woo! So this is the biggest brook trout of my life. I can tell you that for sure, because I've never caught one over 15 inches before. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at that color. Uh, uh. Okay, wow. Oh my God. Look at those colors. Nice. Uh. Wow, what a beautiful fish. My God. So Robin, uh, what people of course didn't hear or see were the other superlatives that Tom used because they were not PBS friendly. Um, so we did put them in the show, but he went on and that was the top. And if you, I don't know if you noticed it, but uh, anybody watching that video, we were only to our knees. And that's how big the brook trout was in that little run using mice patterns. And then we went down to where the pools were and that's when it got stupid, how many fish we caught in that run. But the thing was, if you started, started the clip, you saw that float plane going away. So you've got the ability at your lodge to take people around in the river and go to places near the lodge, which is fantastic. 
but you also do flyouts. Do you know, do you not still, uh, Robin? Uh, yes. Well, we fish an awful lot of river. Uh, uh, the Woods River system is over a hundred miles long from the headwaters down to where it, it runs into the big Smallwood Reservoir. And we try to fish as much of it as we can. So we spread pressure out uh, over all the different pools. So we're not hitting the same ones day in and day out. And also it gets just a lot of adventure and a lot of unknown. And uh, for, for the, for the fish, for the fisher folks that come to fish with us. And uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a really nice thing uh, in Labrador. Unlike in Quebec and, uh, and maybe other provinces, uh, if you're a licensed outfitter, you can fish anywhere in Labrador you want, as long as you don't get within um, a certain distance of other established outfitters, which, of course, we always respect that. And and I, I've never heard of any case of that happening with anyone with an airplane. But uh, so, you know, it opens up, you know, for char trips, and Arctic char trips and and other salmon trips and, and, and places to go and find some little creek. I mean. And the, the the really golden thing about uh, Three Rivers program is we've we've got we found I don't know ten or fifteen little creeks that in a lot of places you can jump across and yet they hold four five six seven pound brook trout and it's just an absolutely astounding I'm sure Paul's probably got some up at the headwaters of his rivers too that you just would never guess I mean. You know, I could tell so many stories, but one I walked into when we first got there and, and the water was not even halfway up my boots as it flowed out into the little pond. And as I walked further back, it got a little deeper and the rocks got bigger and they got green moss on them. And I, I looked around and I saw a white stripe that was about four inches long, which was the, the pectoral fin of a brook trout sticking out behind a rock. And the brook trout was six, seven pounds you know, and, and that's that's the kind of uh, of wonder that you come across, you know, and something that we, you know, we we go the extra mile and our guests do as well to to have that benefit of a of a, the of a float plane, the maneuverability and of, of having a float plane in camp, right? Right. So, and that I want to bring this to the next point related to both lodges because you know the one thing and you. You uh, both gentlemen, when you go to these trade shows or people are calling you and they're asking you say, why is it so expensive to go to Labrador? Why does it cost me so much to go to your lodge? You must be making a ton of money. But the people out there don't realize how expensive it is to hire a float plane to bring people in, to bring supplies and to bring fuel and all these other things. Uh, Robin, I'll let you go first to, to talk about this. And then I'd like to get Paul's opinion because you're both about equal distances from float plane base, right? And it's a very expensive yeah. venture to bring in stuff. So can you talk a little bit about this? Because like I said, when people talk to me about Alaska and other places and just, they, they say, well, why, why does it only cost this to go there? And it's like, because it's a drive to. As soon as you get on a float plane, everything doubles, triples, quadruples. So can you explain that, Robin? I can. First of all, Paul and I are both very fortunate and that we don't rely on our fishing lodges for our income. We had other careers, and but there's an awful lot of folks right now up in Quebec and Labrador and Newfoundland that are suffering because they've built beautiful places and they do depend on them. And this virus and this pandemic has been tough uh, on a lot of people. It's tough on us, but it ain't like it is on a lot of folks who depend on that money for their for their living. Uh, yeah, uh, float planes. Well, I'll give you an example. A float plane, when I built the lodge in 1998, we flew 72 sorties, 72 otter float planes from Wabush into camp to carry materials in and supplies. And at that time, a, 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 an, an otter trip from uh, a town 150 miles away into camp was $715. Now it's about $5,600. So it's seven times more expensive now than it was 23 years ago. So uh, every Coke can or beer can that flies into our camp costs a little over $2 just to get it in there. So you can imagine what carrying a bag of concrete if you're building or two by fours or two by eights and wood stoves. Think about a wood stove that weighs 800 pounds. Well, that costs me $1,600 just to get the damn thing in camp. So everything revolves in the bush. Everything revolves around float planes, 
their reliability, their access, and particularly their cost. Yeah. So um, I'm going to just put you on mute there. Uh, Paul, yep. what's your take on the whole factor <laughs> of flow plugins? Okay. That's exactly it. And it's exactly what we said. And, and, you know, just for people's information is that the, I own two lodges and I'm on the board of directors of the Quebec Outfitters Federation of Quebec. And that's exactly what's going on. COVID is really, really hurting people that it's their livelihood. Me and Robin, it's a hobby or a love for the North that went too far. <laughs> that's what it was. And uh, no, I don't, I don't earn a living doing that, thank God. But uh, in my annual budgets, float planes were 60% of the cost. Okay. And, you know, whether it's water or, or, uh, or Coke is one thing, gasoline. I'm 126 miles from Labrador City. You can put 2,200 pounds in an otter. And the last time that I flew out of there, it was $4,200 to fly in three drums of gasoline. So $1,500 of gas costs you $5,700. That's it right there. It's the gasoline for the boats. It's the float planes. It's the diesel generator. And we did convert partially to solar, but that, that's the big cost. The, the first one was float planes. The second one is staff. That's it. That's where it's yeah, played. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then you gotta get there. And you know, it's from Montreal, if you drive, it's two days. And and I would tell people at shows, you know, we, we were talking before about the Smallwood Reservoir, which uh, I crossed to get those canoes that are there. They were brought to Labrador City by truck. Then we drove them to the lobstick structure, which is the biggest weir. This is the largest hydroelectric. Uh, reservoir in Canada. It's the ninth biggest body of water of Canada, and it's larger than one third of the state of Massachusetts. And then we had to take the canoes across the, 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 the reservoir with a GPS, because it's kind of like being almost in the open ocean. You don't see the other side at times. And then we went up a river that we'd never been up before, didn't even know where we were going to sleep. Okay. So we cut down the alders because it was raining, found a place to sleep, and it's literally GPSs, shotguns, and satellite phones. It took us two days to get the canoes up there. So there's a cost to that too, eh? It's, uh, but it, it, we do it because we love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I can't wait to go back. All right, Paul, if you don't mind uh, muting your mic. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, I wanna show some videos uh, that I think everyone will enjoy. And it's talking more about, you know, the types of fishing that, you know, that you have, you both have, and you both talked about, which is, you know, we talked about the canoes to get around or the flow planes, however you get, but what do people come there for? Walk and wait. I mean, I love walking, waiting and fishing places. And so uh, let's have a look at a video, which I think people enjoy. And it's, uh, I'm gonna use the guy who's been with us a long time and he's the eye candy of the new fly fisher. Okay, Paul, where would you want me to start here? We've come to this run. I have no idea where the fish are. Where do you want me to start? Well, what we have here, we're starting, this is the very first pool on the Mackenzie River where it empties out of Andrea Lake. And we're gonna start fishing at the very beginning of the drop-off, which is about 30 feet away. Now, the drop-off, I can see some rocks. The end, of the, the end of those rocks is the drop-off? That's correct. It'll drop okay. down to about eight feet. And then I always think it's preferential to fish your way anywhere, everywhere you go. So we are going to fish our way back to the back of the pool. Okay. Now how, many, gonna, how many casts before we take a step? Just cover water, just okay. like you would with Atlantic salmon. We want right. to cover all the water. We don't know exactly where they'll be, but they'll often be along the lip here, the rise. Okay. And when the fish are takers here, they will generally be in Labrador. We find that they will move to the back of the pool okay. where the current is bringing them. But food. you don't you don't disregard the front of the pool. You try that first Never. and work your way back. Okay. You, you fish everywhere. Okay. Every little depression in the river mm -hmm. can hold a fish. Got him. That is outstanding. Paul, that is outstanding. You know what? I was just retrieving in the leech, dragging it along the, along the surface, and he struck at it. So I put it back there again. A different retrieve. A different retrieve. and Something that made it look injured. Fish, oh, that's a good fish. That's a good fish. <laughs> it's a good fish. Yeah. So I'm trying, I'm well trying to gain well control. Done. Well done, Bill. Trying to gain control, get the line. 
on the oh, reel. Oh yeah, we got a good fish here. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> what, look at the colors on that. Good fight, good fight. This is a seven weight rod. Look how it's bent it over. These are nothing but muscle, these fish. They, uh, they fight the current all their life. The same time that you're fighting that fish, you got a four pound brookie yep. right behind you where you're breaking the current. Oh yeah, yeah, right below, I can see him right there. <laughs> what a beautiful fish. I'm gonna raise his head up as best I can. Look at the size of the fin. He's coming towards you. And put the dip net in and away we and go. And we got him. Got him, all right, outstanding, Paul. Very typical okay. for Northwestern Labrador. I'll get you to hold my rod. And this guy. And here you go with your first Mackenzie River McKenzie brook River trout. Brook trout. And it's a beautiful. Look at that. Look at the coloring on them. They're starting to color up for spawn. This guy hit on top, just like a mouse pattern, which is outstanding. It's a male? It's a male. Yeah. Let's get her down, get him down in the water. And Excellent. Look at that. Excellent. No harm done. Huh? Paul? Well, You'll fight another day. You'll fight another you weren't day. lying when you no, said no. you got some good brook trout here. My first brook trout, that was three and a half, four pounds. Not a bad way to start. I love it. This is great. Paul, if you want to try on your mic. Yeah. Tell us awesome. about the fishing. I know we talked about the mice, but dry fly streamers. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Actually, uh, when we did that show, um, we had we had low pressure come in and we had rain. And uh, we started off with uh, streamers and leeches. And then when the low pressure came in, we were sight fishing them with uh, with uh, indicators and nymphs. And um, a good pool to give an example of it is the mouse hole that you were on. OK, basically, it's a funnel. And then the water comes in and you've got a rocky ledge. We're standing on the edge of a rocky ledge. And then you've got another rocky ledge on the outside and then a lip at the back. So you, you don't want to get too close because they'll hang on, on, the, on the first ledge. So the first ledge closest to us, we fish that with a nymph and an indicator. Often two nymphs or a, a dry fly and a nymph. But to correctly fish the outside ledge, you got to fish that with a dry fly. And the back of the pool, well, you're either going to swing a mouse or you're going to swing a streamer. And um, when I say streamers, okay, I've spent entire days fishing. Well, I love fishing with streamers on those rivers because they're predators and large predators eat small fish. Okay. They're looking for big meals. And I'm talking of number twos. That's the only size of streamer I use on that river is number twos. And another thing that's really important, and I use that pool as an example, I, I was there one day with a friend fishing. We were sh when when uh, we didn't we didn't have guests or it was friends. I would fish, and I saw a fish rise on the outside ledge. And he was fishing a dry fly, so I told him, "Come over here. We got to take her on the outside." I think it only took two casts, and this thing came up as a brook trout does, real that really slow take where you see their back roll. And he set the hook, and then it just started taking out line, and it was a beast. I, I, I'm telling you, it's, I think, seven or eight pounds. And um, straightened out his hook. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, you're spending how much to do a trip of a lifetime to maybe catch a fish of a lifetime? And you tie flies at home with cheap hooks? And like, like Robin said, like I, I'm, I'm from Canada. I fished in Canada my whole life. So I, I never got used to the leader system of the three X's and that. We go by pounds. <laughs> okay. And, and I fish with the 12 pound test. And when I start swinging streamers down farther on the river, 14 pound test, 16 pound test, it doesn't matter. It, you just need, you need that strong leader to hold them in the current. And these things have teeth. You want to be able to get them in and release them, set them back. And uh, if you come back the next year, maybe get another chance at them. All right, Paul, if you don't mind just uh, muting your mic for a sec. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I gotta say that the the most you know fishing for brook trout with mice patterns is such a visual experience. But throwing a dry fly and you have those hatches in July, end of June through July into August can be pretty magical. Uh, you get some great evening hatches. So the the type of uh, the flies that people say in New, the New England states that they're used to seeing the Drakes, the Hendricksons. Um, even hexagenia, 
you get in, in Labrador. And when the hexes are on, I mean, that's like a small helicopter. But it just lights up. I've been on uh, rivers there and seen a hundred fish going and uh, it's quite something. But then the streamer fishing, I'm like you, I love streamer fishing because you're casting into three feet of water. You think, well, there'll be nothing big in there. All of a sudden this toilet bowl flush and you got the biggest brook trout you've ever seen in your life coming after your fly full bore. Doesn't mean he's going to take it, but you get that excitement. So going to that, what I'm going to do is, uh, and thank you very much, Paul. That was, that was great. Um, Robin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a video that uh, of a, a brook trout I caught at your place. Uh, Tom actually let me fish a couple times. And uh, what I'll do, uh, we'll talk about what the experience is at your place, because you have the same. I mean, you've got great waters to wade, get around to different places, and you've got the dry fly fishing, you've got the streamer fishing, and of course the mice fishing. So I'm gonna play this video and then we'll come back and chat a little bit about that. And that's all hoping that I can make this video work right. Here we go. Ooh, big fish. Oh, look at that power. Oh, it's coming at me real and fast. He's using this current and this five weight rod. We got both a five and a six here and they're perfect for this place. This is where you need to have really good leader. And I'm using 10 pound one uh, X leader. Okay, and getting his head up, getting his head up. Ah. The size of that brook shirt, it's going in that. It's unbelievable. Let me get my fly out here. It's barbus, so it should pop right out. There it is. Comes out, drop that. Beautiful, beautiful brook shirt. And colors. Incredible colors in the fins. It's absolutely insane how aggressive these brook trout can be. For the remainder of the day, we continued to fish using mice patterns. Every few casts, a fish would explode on the surface and engulf our fly. This was another remarkable day of fishing and something every angler should experience in their life. Like all outstanding days, they go by quickly. Soon we're back at the lodge, exchanging stories of the great fishing while taking in yet another beautiful sunset. Robin, um, yeah. I didn't. I did a little bit of dry fly fishing, did some streamer fishing, but once I found out, and I was there in August, that they were on the mice patterns, I really had a hard time saying no to using them. And as you heard, I was using ten pound tests for the tippet on you know about a nine foot leader, and somebody asked about that, and we were using principally five six weight rods. I did bring a seven in case we had the high winds. Uh, why don't you give us some feedback on what you recommend people bring for equipment? Right. Five could be a little light unless it's one of the newer, really with a lot of backbone. So we recommend six to eights. Uh, yeah. Nine foot leaders are fine. Uh, like I said earlier, they're not leader shy. They, um, you want fluorocarbon leader is greatly preferred because the as paul said the brook trout the big brook trout have a lot of teeth and you don't want to stick your thumb in one like you do in a small mouth bass or a large mouth bass or it'll come out perforated but uh, but you want to use fluorocarbon you know 1x 10 12 10 8 pound in that range like that uh but seven or eight weight rods are nice on windy days or if you have to go fishing for a pike or a lake trout uh, for the bigger fish. I mean, we got lake trout. We've caught them up to 35, 40 pounds and pike are, are absolutely insane. But uh, uh, there's someone, yeah, someone asked earlier about um, the, the size of the rods and, and, and I answered that. But w one thing, I know that you guys really got it off on the mice patterns because you were there, as I recall, in middle or late August. 
Yeah, so we're having a little problem with your uh, picture there, Robin. Your Wi-Fi is uh, off a little bit. I'm going to put up still a there? picture. Of we, yeah, still there. Uh, yeah, I was there uh, second week of August because okay. the fish were just colored up. And I think okay. the thing is, and I want to show a picture here, uh, if you don't mind. This is the lake trout because on any day where it clouded up, and we could catch lake trout in three feet of water, not far from the lodge. Right. Exactly. I think I've got a picture here. Hang on. There's Tom with the lake trout that was 17 pounds, and now he had we're using eight weight rods. Right. Exactly. And both you and Paul have got that. Well, my I'll point explain. Being about, Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I was just going to say that when you were there, the brook trout have had a whole, you know, a whole summer, six or seven or eight weeks to feed. And as they move toward the spawn and they begin to congregate, uh, they, it takes, it usually takes something very tempting and very large, a big hunk of protein to get them to move on it like they move on the mice patterns. But in, in three rivers in our, in our river, we catch more fish on a size 14 royal wolf than any other fly, including woolly buggers, including mice, including green nymphs, which is a, but uh, we catch an awful lot of flies on that royal wolf. Don't ask me why they like it. It doesn't imitate a damn thing. But I think that little red band in the middle of the peacock curl is is like something magic for brook trout. <laughs> but toward the end of the season in August, the bigger the meal, the better. I mean, we fish with streamers that are five, six inches long, big, you know, uh, uh, zonker strips, sculpins that, uh, you know, you would think that would scare attracted to eat it. So. Big is better in late August for sure. I'm just throwing up a few patterns that I had on hand and yeah. I threw up earlier when you're talking about the Royal Wolf. Uh, that's the one that's uh, highlighted yeah. there. I've also got a humpy parachute Adams yeah. and of course the stimulator. And it's kind of unique because the Royal Wolf, I fished that. I remember when I was first learning to fly fish and it was one of those patterns they recommended. Right. I never had any luck with it except for in Labrador. I don't know why. It's something about the way the light spectrum is or the way the silhouette works really, really well. Right. So uh, why don't we, well, Paul, why don't you turn on your mic and why don't you give us your opinion of Fly Supreme? Oh, well, look, they're basically the same fishery, okay, because we're only 25 miles apart. And uh, me, it's uh, big streamers, okay. Number one on the list for me is uh, Schultz's S3 olive with the rubber legs number two that's a killer on our river absolute killer that catches everything we have a fly that we created called a dw special where uh, in late august when these big brookies color up and like robin said that they, they become uh, finicky they don't they don't like to move on on small bait we created a fly that we thought would imitate a, a baby brook trout and all it is is an adapted muddler um, a conehead muddler a number two conehead straight eye and then the it's on the top brown and black bucktail and on the bottom orange and white bucktail with flashaboo in the middle and uh, you strip that tie that on a loop knot and strip it and it bobs and weaves it's a killer on our river I, i've been out days where i fished with nothing else and uh, caught what we call a grand slam meaning brook trout landlocked salmon lake trout northern pike and whitefish without ever changing flies. Then in uh, nymphs, prince nymph is really good for us, okay? In uh, dry flies, uh, olive stimulators, because the hatches late in the season are caddis flies, they're big and they tend to have olive bodies. On days where there's high pressure, orange bombers, but not too big. Number six, orange bombers. I always fish them on a loop knot because it, it uh, it tends to move more and uh, mice patterns are great, but not all mice patterns are created equal. What you want is the master splinter. That's the ticket. And that in August, the only difference between our river and Robin's river is that we have landlocked salmon in the river 
and starting in August, they start the bigger ones start to run up. And we we even discovered that the landlocked salmon will take mice, wow. which you wouldn't think. Yeah, they chase it just like a northern pike. It, and then you get that you get that uh, really really um, visual take. But it, it comes down to what Robin said: is that these big, these big fish have to eat in a short season and put on the weight to get through the winter. So they're looking for big meals, you fish with big flies. And, you know, if, we, if we're in the wind and we're casting big flies, uh, don't show up with a four weight. <laughs> and I think uh, seven and eight there's weights. There's a great photo that's on uh, the Three Rivers uh, Lodge website. It says it all. That's, that's, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that gentleman landed that fish. Uh, Robin probably knows, but uh, was testing his equipment. So, uh, Paul, if I could just get you to shut your mic down for a second. Thank you. Go ahead there, uh, Robin. I think you're uh, – you're, uh, Robin, your mic's turned off. I said we tied, we tied his line on the back of a long boat. Uh, it says – It's good. Am I on? Yeah, can hear right. yeah we can, can hear you. Hear all right. Yeah. Okay, good. I said he, we tied his line on the back of a Lund boat and took off down the river. That's where we did <laughs> that picture. Actually, no, that was Girok again. Uh, and, and, one, and one of the really special places. And he just took, I don't believe that was a brook trout. I believe he sent about a 15 or 20 pound lake trout on that. But it looked like it was tied to the back of a Jeep. I mean, the. <laughs> The fish took off uh, a long way. I mean, he was hundreds of yards gone. I mean, John was in his backing for sure. But anyway, yeah, I mean, this Labrador is full of surprises. One thing I want to throw in real quick, if you don't mind, is the fish, the excitement, the sunsets, the Milky Way, all those things are staggeringly beautiful. But what really pulls people back to my camp, and I'm sure to Paul's too, is the quality of the people that work there. And our staff has beyond superb. Uh, I cannot tell you enough about how the beautiful women that run things at our place, our guides, young and old, uh, our manager who's been with us 20 years, these people are what make uh, uh, those little moments in between fish and when your roof leaks or when the toilet doesn't flush or when you're, uh, you can't eat uh, grain products or whatever it is, they're the ones who pull it out for you and make things all right again. So a big, uh, a big cheers for my group. And I, and I know Paul's guys too, and they're wonderful people too. So Thanks. that's, Thanks that's the draw. That, that's the magic. Right. So we're, we're kind of at the end of the show, but I think uh, this is a good time for us to talk about, come full circle to something you brought up before, Robin, which was how many people have been hurt by this pandemic and by things and by the fact that the border right now is not open. In fact, today, uh, here in Canada, the federal government extended the border closure to the 21st of June. Um, we're all hopeful very hopeful that the border is going to open in early July, first or second week, but there's no guarantees. And both you gentlemen, uh, one of the reasons we got together, uh, because we didn't do a show with you this past year, and that's traditionally who we have on this live event, but we got together because you said to me, hey, look, I, we like to invite Canadians. Typically, we get mostly American clients that are interested in coming to Labrador, but you know, we want to do something special. We want to see if we can get some Canadian clients whether they're from Ontario or Quebec, Nova Scotia, doesn't matter, to come to the lodge because we've got openings in July and some in August even, but in July when you typically don't have openings. Like, Paul, I know you're booked like years in advance, and I think, Robin, when I talked to you last time before the pandemic, you were looking, your books were full. I mean, you, you got waiting lists for certain weeks. So this is not typically, you know, an opportunity, and – and July is a fantastic month. I mean, the hatches are happening. The dry fly fishing is good. I mean, it's 
it's like everything and and you, and you still have what Paul talked about the box of chocolate fishing where you cast into a pool with a streamer and you don't know if it's going to be a pike a lake trout or a big brook trout i mean it's it's fantastic so i just well, well robin why don't you explain what you are offering and then i'll let paul talk about it and uh why we're why you're doing it and then i'll while you're doing it if you don't mind i'm just gonna throw up more pictures about why going to labrador is so fantastic it's, it's my favorite like i love ontario and i love everywhere but labrador is like very unique there's more bears than there's people right <laughs> well yeah uh uncertainty we have lived with uncertainty for 14 15 months now not knowing what the next day is going to going to bring. And when you hear something from somebody the next day, you hear exactly the opposite from someone else. So it's the uncertainty that has caused us all this angst, but we have to plan. I mean, we have a business, we have people who really want to participate. So right now it looks like to me, we're, we're waiting on contingencies. We're waiting for the Canada border to open. If us guests are going to come, we're waiting for provincial borders to open but among Canadian provinces, if we can go from one place to another. And so we've got contingencies there. And one of those contingencies is that uh, before the U.S. types are allowed into Canada, we would host uh, Canadians in, into the camp. And hopefully your provincial borders will be open so that allow that. So we're looking at, you know, the end, 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 uh, end of July to have, you know, kind of our all Canadian week and, and to encourage that, you know, our, Pricing, and I believe Paul's is too, but he can tell you that our pricing is is in U.S. dollars, but we're going to offer the cost at, at par with Canadian dollars for all our Canadian guests this year. So it's a little 20, 25 percent incentive for folks to, to come see us. That's fantastic, Robin. And before I switch over to Paul, um, I think uh, this is a good opportunity also, also to mention to state that uh, yeah. – uh, just could you, could you grab your mic there, Paul, for a second? Thanks. That uh, you also have arranged for a charter flight to take people from Montreal to Shefferville, uh, and then they disembark, and then they get on a float plane to fly into either lodge. And um, can you explain what that is and what, why you've set that up? Correct. No, oh, Robin, I think we're having some technical difficulties. You want to try again? Unfortunately, you're breaking up. Yeah, I think you're yeah, having some Wi-Fi again. issues. I didn't hear what your question was. So the question was, Robin, is that uh, it's not so much a question. It's just the, one of the things you discussed the other day is that uh, you and Paul were so concerned about making sure that people didn't have problems getting to the camps that you've even set it up. This will work for both Americans and Canadians, but – you're flying people on a charter flight from Montreal once a week to Shefferville, which right. is on the border with Labrador. You get off that flight, go to the float plane base and fly into your respective camps. Again, making it very easy because Air Canada's had problems servicing some of the areas. Exactly. The smaller towns, particularly like Wabush uh, and Labrador, have not been serviced uh, in, in quite a while now. So, yeah, we're going to arrange that charter flight out of Montreal and just, you know, uh, you come into Montreal, spend the night on us in a hotel that's right there by the airport, jump on a, on a bus, go to the float to, to the plane. We'll fly you right to Shefferville off that onto a float plane and into camp. So you'll be into camp by midday. That's fantastic. And, uh, so makes me make want to go. Cool. That alone makes me want to go because I've had to, I've taken multiple flights to get to your place. Uh, and that's not a criticism. It's just how remote. And there's only the people go, well, how many flights a day do they go in there? And I go, one. Like, they don't understand. This is like, and now that's in jeopardy. And that's why you, you've done what you've done. Um, I think it's a good opportunity, Paul. Uh, why don't you turn your mic and I'll let you say your part. Well, what we did, uh, actually, we, were, we, we, we planned to do this uh, last year also because it just made sense. We've combined our operations. It's two separate lodges, but we're good friends. And it just made sense for our travelers. So all of our guests stay at the same hotel. And as Robin mentioned, it's a shuttle bus that takes you to the, um, to the charter. The charter goes straight to Shefferville. There's two turbo waters waiting. 
one goes to each lodge, turns over the guests, the charter waits there to take the outcoming guests back to Montreal. So anybody that's traveled to Labrador or other you know parts of the world know sometimes it's it was two days to get into the camp. And then if you came out and the weather was bad and you missed your flight back home, you, you were another two days. Well, we've eliminated that. And uh, you'd be leaving um, Montreal at eight o'clock in the morning and um, you'll have lunch in the lodge. That's unbeatable. And the next day, you're back in Montreal by probably 5 p.m. And uh, the way things looking in Montreal now, where we're going to be completely reopened, even if you decide to spend another night in Montreal, it's not a bad place to spend a, a night. We've got some of the best restaurants in the world. And uh, no, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in the same situation, especially when you get to, say, August, where we have the landlocked salmon. We're sold out two years ahead of time. And what's happened this year is I've had I've had guests, American guests, that have uh, asked to be moved to 2022 because of you know travel concerns. Some of them are physicians, and they didn't know if they could get the time off. So it's very rare. But I actually have I have water available in August in our prime weeks, right now, and uh, the border, the U.S. border, is a concern. But I really believe that Canadians will be allowed to travel there. Uh, very soon, very soon, at, at least in early July. Yeah, and we're, we're also offering at par. Okay, so for any Canadians watching this, if you want a great trip to a wonderful place, and uh, I can't say enough about it, but to get it at par, and people say, well, why aren't you char charging it at par right now? And it's like, well, you gotta understand, it's that expensive because it's that expensive to bring people in. I mean, it, if you, one guy wrote uh, an email to me when I put up the post, uh, the first post on Monday about us uh, and this offer. He said, well, it's nice of you guys to offer it to Canadians uh, at par when it should have been like that from the start. And I said, well, I, I emailed him back and I said, yeah, they'll give it to you, but it's not going to be a par because when it's in U.S. dollars, that's based on what that's going to exchange into in Canadian because it costs this much money. So. It, for the sake of words, if it's $100 in U.S. dollars, then when we charge you in Canadian, it's going to be 125 because that is what it costs. Uh, it's a very expensive business you both are running in terms of running for uh, the operations. And um, it seems like most businesses I know, you said 60% of the cost, your full plane charges. Usually that's labor. So this is kind of an anomaly, but it's very expensive. And I've heard the same story from lodge operators and Northern Manitoba, Northern Saskatchewan, Alaska, etc. Float planes, the cost of servicing them, aviation fuel, everything. It keeps going up and up and up, and not to mention the insurance. So, so that's, that's passed that's on to you, you, which then, of course, has to be passed on to the customers. But that's why, for any Canadians right now that are watching this, your offer is exceptionally generous. And for any Americans that are watching this, and when the border opens, it sounds like for the first time, you both might have some short notice openings if they want to come. Because normally you don't have those spots in August, Paul. And Robin, you don't have spots, period. I mean, it's very rare you can get a group of four guys. So to somebody that's watching this uh, this this uh, live event tonight and they're, they're going, well, that sounds really good. Maybe I can go. This is an opportunity to get to your lodges and hit prime time. So... We were saying about how one guy wrote uh, to us just shortly and I put it up. There are the two respective websites uh, for both Mackenzie River Lodge and for uh, Three Rivers Lodge. And uh, Robin, I'll, I'll let you uh, speak first if there's anything else you want to say or if you want to put out your phone number. But the bottom line is right now operators are standing by waiting for any phone calls. Now, I got a joke. But uh, if anybody is interested, this is a great time, and it's it's still May. You have time to put together a group of, of friends and get a world-class fishing trip and catch brook trout that are the thing of dreams. Robin. Well, just good night to everybody. It's a pleasure meeting uh, you online. For those I can't see your faces, but hope to some people out there that know us. I think maybe even a couple of our staff may be watching. And hello to you guys. Paul, good to see you again. We talk on the phone often, but it's nice to see your face. And Colin, maybe another time up.
up in camp, huh? Uh, I like that. I like that. I'm time poor, like a lot of people. All right. Thank okay. you, Robin. Well, Paul, we've all been uh, a lot. We've been through a lot. Yep. In the last 14 months. And hang in there. It's almost over. Let's hope. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Well, to me, fly fishing anyways, fly fishing is, um, is a pretext to visit some of the most beautiful places left on the planet and spend time with people you enjoy being with. And, uh, you know, uh, as Robin said, it's the guides, it's the people you're with. It's talking about the fishing at night. It's the whole experience. It's, it's absolutely, you, you know, and we do this on purpose, but we don't have any Wi-Fi and we don't want any Wi-Fi. <laughs> no news, no Wi-Fi. You get away from everything. And then all it is, is nature and uh, you, the fish, your friends and the people, the great people you're, you're with in the lodge. So if anybody wants to experience Labrador, you know, give us a call. It's a good time. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both for uh, being uh, part of this broadcast, helping people understand a little bit. of. We could have gotten a lot more detail. And in the future, I'd love to have you back, uh, maybe separately, and talk about each of your respective places, talk about how to prepare for coming, the things to bring. You know, uh, I'm glad you said what you did. I mean, a five weight. I took a five weight there, and you saw that video clip. I was getting my butt handed to me. Uh, oh, look at this. No news and no Wi-Fi. Can I come live at your lodge, Paul? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with them, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thanks, gents, for both uh, being part of this. And MackenzieRiverLodge.com or TrophyLabrador.com. You want to have a, a look at their respective uh, lodges. They've got videos. They've got photos. But more importantly, they've got an email and a phone number. Get a hold of uh, either Robin or Paul. See what they have available. See if you can come, whether you're Canadian, American. I think you it's, like it's going to be an experience you'll always remember for the rest of your life. So thanks everybody for watching. Thanks, Chance, for uh, being part of this. And we'll see you all soon on the water.